Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion today. Uh, my name is Ty Furman, and I am the Managing Director of the BU Arts Initiative. And I'm thrilled to be here with our partner on this project, David Carballo, who is an assistant provost and in um, uh, Latin American studies and archaeology here at BU. I just wanted to take a few moments um, to do uh, a land acknowledgement. So it's important for us, particularly in a program like this, to acknowledge that here at Boston University, the land we're operating on is the traditional homeland of the Massachusetts people, their neighbors, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag as well. We acknowledge the painful history of settler colonialism, genocide, and forced removal from this territory. And we honor, respect, and celebrate the many indigenous people still connected to this land. You can learn who the original inhabitants and stewards of the land you're occupying are by going to native-land.ca. That's native-land.ca. And we encourage you to explore the full history of the area in which you live. Now I'm gonna turn it over to David who will tell you more about the Hostile Terrain exhibit and programs that we've been doing. Thanks Ty for that introduction and that acknowledgement. Um, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all members of the BU Extended Community uh, to our panel titled Migration Policy, Border Issues and Campus Reflections on Hostile Terrain 94. Uh, as Ty said, I'm David Carballo. I'm a faculty member in Anthropology, Archaeology, and Latin American Studies within the College of Arts and Sciences, and also Assistant Provost for General Education. Um, the format for today's proceedings will have a panel of five campus experts who are working on different issues relating to migration and the southern border, and they'll each present the, the work that they're doing in about five minutes. Um, five minutes each, that is. And then we'll turn to reflecting on the Hostile Terrain 94 exhibit that's uh, here on campus. We're one of the hosting institutions, and you can see up on this slide, um, and start making connections between it and these projects, as well as the interdisciplinary overlap going on um, among these projects on campus. Uh, so I, before that, I'd like to say a few um, words of acknowledgement to supporters, the BU Arts Initiative who we're collaborating with on this, the uh, CAS Social Science Division, the College of General Studies, the Center for Latin American Studies, the History Department, Archaeology Program, and the BU Hub for their uh, financial support and uh, their uh, different con contributions in terms of uh, helping to um, assemble and display the exhibit. Um, next slide, please. A little bit of background on the exhibit being here, and it, uh, we at BU being one of the hosting institutions. Um, it might seem strange that an archaeologist, which is what I what I primarily do, um, is organizing an exhibit on migration. Um, but that comes from a 20-year uh, connection to Mexico and also to the work of Jason de Leon, who's depicted here and is the director of the Undocumented uh, Migration Project. And the UMP is the organization that uh, put together this exhibit, Jason working with his collaborators, a lot of students involved in that project and, and a lot of other researchers uh, and artists. There are 150, some 150 institutions that are hosting this exhibit currently. It was originally intended for 94 to match the Hostile Terrain 94 name, which comes from the policy that it is highlighting, which was enacted in 1994. But there was so much interest, not just in the US, but also in Europe and Latin America, that there are now 150 hosting institutions. Um, but by being hybrid and having a return to campus, we're one of a smaller number that's actually engaging uh, with this exhibit directly. So some of the background here is that in, in some ways the, the work of the Undocumented Migration Project could be called an archaeology of the contemporary. So archaeologists, of course, study material culture, uh, human occupations, the artifacts and belongings that people used in the past, but sometimes that past might be relatively recent. It might be contemporary times. Um, and so through this project, uh, Jason and team have been understanding uh, this 
this process, this human process unfolding over decades uh, through the lens of, of material culture, which can then also complement or in some cases contradict other lines of evidence that we have from uh, surveys, from, from uh, government statistics or NGO statistics. So here you see, for example, on the, the left, a depiction of a site that we worked at. It's a pre-Hispanic site that dates back 2,500 years before present. And um, Jason's there at the, the, the total station, which we use for mapping sites. And you can see some of the artifacts that we would recover from a pre-Hispanic site like that. Um, while excavating at this site in central Mexico, uh, Jason would start talking with the people who we were working with, and he became more interested in their stories, in particular their stories of migrating, and sometimes harrowing tales of uh, two brothers in particular, I remember, that you know had gotten involved uh, or gotten caught up in a shootout because two rival coyote smuggling bands were fighting over um, uh, the, the migrants that uh, they were bringing into Texas. And that, that really took uh, Jason's career in a different path, and he became interested in applying archaeological methods to studying migration and border issues. So you see on the right, um, this sort of work that the UMP does in documenting sites and uh, artifacts, in this case, uh, water bottles and, and um, uh, uh, backpacks, etc. Next slide, please. Um, another element that's sort of archaeological is just the focus on landscape and on and movement uh, through um, this these borderlands. So uh, you know, uh, landscape can be seen as an active agent in this process. It's through U.S. policy driving people away from large urban ports of entry and into this desert environment, the Sonoran Desert, why it's called hostile terrain, um, that uh, uh, prompted this exhibit and, and also um, commemoration uh, and exploration of the human toll in terms of lives lost in this study area, which you see on this map over here. Um, and also, you know, in the projects that uh, I've been involved in, in in Mexico, although mostly focused on the pre-Hispanic and early colonial eras, uh, it's very apparent that this process was happening all around us. And the two projects I've been most involved in are on major rail lines where, uh, you know, for the last 20 years, we would see migrants moving, especially from Central Mexico, or Central America, sorry, through Mexico uh, and onwards towards uh, the Mexican border, uh, US-Mexico border. Next slide, please. So, the exhibit is uh, in the process of being assembled, and um, I, we are very grateful to everyone who has contributed time, and, um, and, and we hope that people will continue to contribute time to commemorating the deaths at the border. There are some 3,200 documented ones and many other undocumented ones, but uh, what the, the exhibit does in particular is um, highlight those bodies that have been found uh, in the Sonoran Desert, and this, you know, the UMP moved uh, not intentionally at first, but from studying the material culture left behind by migrants to then seeing uh, people who had perished in 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 the border. Um, and so we have a few different things going on. If you know, you're on uh, the second floor of the GSU, right outside of the BU Arts Initiative, you'll see the display and you'll see a table where um, you can sign up to fill out tags. And some trigger warning is appropriate here because the tags do record some graphic information about the state of the bodies uh, that, that were found, uh, that have been found so far. Um, and you know the the exhibit, although it's in a number of institutions, it's it's customizable. So what we're doing at BU uh, includes this sort of programming, like of panel experts uh, showing a documentary. But we've also been running a co-curricular through the BU Hub, the General Education Program uh, Hub CC199. And I'd like to thank all the students uh, who are involved in that, and they're you know on this call. They've been helping to uh, assemble the exhibits, fill out tags, pin them to the board and they will soon turn towards uh, making their own presentations and dissemination projects to be able to share this with peers in the BU, the broader BU community. And so others who'd like to engage in that way, other student groups um, are very much welcome. Next, please. So the work itself, you could see as a big piece of material culture. Um, it highlights this, the borderlands and um, the Sonoran Desert and what the, the toll of this policy has been 
uh, um, in human lives. And, and uh, the, last week I was tagging, or I'm sorry, I was uh, pinning some tags to uh, the board. And it was really interesting to see how individuals also customize um, this process. So even though we're working within a structure, you know, that uh, of a lot of collaborate, uh, collaborative institutions, um, I noticed that some people had put little notes on the backs of the tags, like te fallamos, we failed you. Um, one thing that I do is when I see a, a you know, Spanish surname, uh, like Yolanda Lopez, I just have to put the accent on the O. It's one way of like giving my own personal tribute um, to, to uh, you know, someone who's lost their life um, uh, trying to cross through this, this, this desert lands. So we can do this at an individual level, we can do it at a community level, um, and the more participation, uh, the better. Next, please. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel of campus experts we have wonderful colleagues, um, just going alphabetically here, Susan Akram from the School of Law, Rachel Nolan from the Pardee School, Adela Pineda from uh, Romance Studies, Jeff Rubin from History and Pardee, and Ana Villarreal from Sociology. So I'll now turn it over to them and they will start explaining their particular projects and then we'll move to discussion. But if you have any questions, please start submitting them through the Q&A. Thanks. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming and for joining us in this important discussion. My congratulations to David and everyone else involved in the Hostile Terrain exhibit. I'm very glad that it's here at BU because it's personalizing an issue that can often feel far away from Boston or perhaps numbers of people casualties but not human individuals. So I think it's really important what you're doing. Um, I will briefly explain my own research and how it's brought me around to some of the migration issues around um, uh, that are related to what we're talking about today. So um, the first thing I'll say is that there was a historic shift at the US border around 2000. Um, it used to be that the vast majority of people crossing that border were Mexican, of course, but we've seen a real shift in recent years. And now the vast majority of people crossing the US Mexico border are actually from Central America, primarily three countries known as the Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala. Guatemala is where I'm lucky enough to get to do my archival research. I'm trained as a historian and as a journalist. And I originally started going to Guatemala ooh, in 2014, a long time ago. I, lived, I had the opportunity to live in Mexico before that. So um, I, I love this part of the project as well. But um, I started going to Guatemala in 2014 to do research on the violence of the civil war there, which lasted for 36 years from 1960 to 1996. It was the bloodiest Cold War conflict in the Western Hemisphere. 200,000 people lost their lives. And still it's relatively little known um, in the United States and how the effects of that very long civil war are helping drive migration even today. So um, I hesitate to put myself in the same breath as Jason de Leon, but like Jason, I um, began by studying something else. I was studying the history of international adoption in Guatemala, but because of course I was living in Guatemala, speaking with my Guatemalan colleagues, friends, neighbors all the time, migration was top of mind. I mean, many people had family members who were either in the process of migrating had already reached the United States or were being deported. So the, I was sort of exposed to the kind of broader trajectory beyond just the um, very hostile terrain in, in the Mexican um, desert that this, that this um, show is so rightly highlighting. I was exposed to kind of the broader um, impact that that has on communities in Guatemala and the worries around leaving in the first instance and then what happens when you get to the United States. So I ended up um, starting to do some research, which up until now I've published uh, only in journalistic form, although I'm um, gonna make it into an academic project as well, on some of the challenges that Guatemalans in particular face as they are migrating up um, to the United States and the reasons for leaving as well. And so the important thing that I wanna say here is that um, many people in the US don't know at least half of the Guatemalan population is indigenous, is, speaks one of 22 Maya languages. Um, and uh, for them, Spanish is a second language. So, and they may speak it to varying degrees of fluency, right? So their challenges that they face as they try to safely cross this very dangerous terrain in Mexico are doubled by the fact that Spanish is not their first language and they face 
um, discrimination, not just in Guatemala, one of the aspects of the Guatemalan Civil War was racialized violence and genocide of certain Mayan groups, uh, especially during the 1980s. But Mayan people in Guatemala face continued discrimination, and that's one of the many reasons um, along with gang violence, along with economic uncertainty, many, you know, domestic violence, many things that people are fleeing Guatemala. Um, so what I was doing was interviewing people first in some of the high migration regions in northern Guatemala about their reasons for leaving, but then I also had the opportunity to interview Mayan language translators in the Bay Area out in California, and I got to do this um, in the context of a story that I wrote for New Yorker magazine that came out uh, earlier this year, like in, in January. And I was trying to focus on the Guatemalans who are not just suffering the consequences of trying to traverse this very difficult terrain, but also once they are here, trying to help some of their countrymen um, overcome some of the gaps in the US immigration system in order to be able to provide translation and have a fair shot at asylum if in fact, um, the, the Guatemalan migrant in question has an asylum claim to make. So I will leave it there. I'm happy to take questions about any aspect of um, the Guatemalan migration patterns in particular, um, but I did want to point out how important this project is to understanding the past and the present of Central American life. So the, the map is far beyond just Mexico and the US border. It extends downward into Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras as well. So thank you so much for your attention. Hello everybody, my name is Adela Pineda and um, I uh, study the relationship between culture and society and politics. The idea of uh, thinking big questions, questions on politics and society through the lens of culture. So I am not a specialist in US in the border, but um, Jason De Leon's exhibit um, made me think. So what I brought you here is, is a reflection. Um, and you can see the way um, I discuss uh, texts that are broader, but also how we can be precise on this issue. So I would like to take my five minutes and pay tribute to the persons who have died at the US-Mexico border without dissociating this thing from politics or better say, necropolitics, the politics of death. Philosopher Giorgio Agamben considers Nazi Germany as a prime example of permanent state of exception. He argues that the political juridical structure of the camp acquire a permanent spatial arrangement that remained continually outside the normal state of law. As the law became suspended, the detainees were surrendered to a zone of indistinction where they could be put to death with impunity. Another philosopher, Akil Membe, thinks that not only the Nazi camp, but also the system of colonial occupation was based on necropolitics. In the colonies, the division of space involved the setting of boundaries and internal frontiers, epitomized by barracks and police stations, regulated by the language of pure force, immediate presence, and brutal direct action. This thinker recalls Franz Fanon's description of the town as a world without spaciousness, where people live and die without reason or purpose. The native town is, crouch, is a crouching village, he wrote, a town on its knees. In our global mobility, the state of exception keeps coming back, keeps operating, particularly in matters of undocumented immigration, because there the final authority is not easily discernible. A patchwork of overlapping and incomplete rights seem to appear. Yet, we cannot dissociate this ambiguity with the global economy driven by a large scale exploitation of natural resources without concern for the impact of its practices. Organized crime, brutal state repression, and massive migrations are closely connected to this type of economy. Incessant demand for raw materials makes borders paradigmatic spaces of contemporary necropolitics. The prevention through deterrence policies instituted by the US in order to prevent non-documented crossing from Mexico to the US has caused the death of thousands and thousands of migrants as they attempted to enter this country crossing the perilous Sonoran Desert. With this policy, the US government relied on the environment of the desert 
to deter these migrants without much help from the border enforcement agency. So the blame of the deaths shifts from government to the environment, a clear suspension of the law. One of the rationales sustaining this policy was to enhance the immigration heritage of the United States. So it was a tactical policy to protect legal from illegal immigration. Such policies produce an imaginary associated with a dead world in which thousands of people considered illegal are portrayed as disposable, conferring upon them the status of living dead. In this dead world, the lines between homicide and suicide are totally blurred. For Jason de Leon, this inhumane policy condemns the migrants to a clandestine death, stripping them away from their humanity as their families are denied the possibility of a spiritual closure. So one of his objectives is to pay tribute to the disappeared. Since memorial times, Veneration of the dead is not only based on respect for the beloved ones, but to ensure a positive disposition towards the living, to cultivate the continuity of ties among communities. Yet there is another reason which has to do with the way we recall the past in order to make sense of the present and the future. According to Jason De Leon, over the past 20 years, the US government has been collecting materials left behind by undocumented immigrants. These artifacts are no longer available for anthropologists like De Leon to study and to have a record of these histories. So he keeps recovering them, but not all of them, right? So Jason De Leon's project is also a counter history, one that tells us stories through material culture of survival, of courage, of struggle. The exhibition composed of thousands of handwritten totags representing migrants who have died trying to cross the Sonoran Desert over a period of more than 20 years makes us commit time and energy to learn about the lives and not only the deaths of so many people and hopefully to think of our own death. With each death, society itself dies a little, wrote Michael Tausig, quoting anthropologist Robert Hertz. What is it about our complacent society that dies? Maybe our capacity to express empathy and solidarity. In his thesis of the philosophy of history, Walter Benjamin stated that only that historian will have the gift of fanning the spark of hope in the past, who is firmly convinced that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins. So we should thank Jason De Leon and his team for his commitment to pay tribute to the deceased, but also to fight for a politics of life and not death. So thank you. That's my reflection. Thank you. My name is Ana Villarreal. I am a sociologist working on the origins and consequences of increased violence in Latin America, with a focus on urban Mexico. I am not a migration scholar, but I am deeply familiarized with the hostility of the terrain along the US-Mexico border, particularly on the Mexican side where I was born and raised. Over the past 15 years, more than 150,000 people have died in Mexico, victims of organized criminal and state violence. More than 60,000 have been disappeared. Quinto Elemento, a team of investigative journalists recently published a report mapping 1,978 mass graves that have been found in Mexico between 2006 and 2016. Mexico has become an incredibly hostile terrain. So when I saw the HT94 exhibit, in which people are invited to write down the names of the more than 3,200 people who have died in the Sonoran Desert since the 1990s, I immediately thought of an initiative that emerged in Mexico in response to increased violence called Bordando por la Paz, or Embroidering Peace, in which people are and well, were and still are invited to embroider the names of those who have died and have been disappeared, including migrants and white handkerchiefs that are displayed in public plazas to raise awareness around this ongoing humanitarian crisis. A college friend of mine first invited me to join a group of family members embroidering the names of um, and really names are the disappeared loved ones in 2012. 
they gathered in a public plaza in downtown Monterrey, which is a large metropolitan area in northeastern Mexico, on a weekly or biweekly basis. The following slide shows one such handkerchief embroidered by the mother of Gustavo Castaneda Puentes, who was detained and disappeared by the police of Monterrey, patrol cars 534, 538, and 540 on February 25th, 2009. His mother adds in quotes, I have your smile tattooed on my heart. Simultaneously, groups of bordadores were forming in other Mexican cities from Tijuana to Guadalajara, from Mexico City to Morelos. The pañuelo, the embroidered handkerchief, provided a means of organizing a nationwide response, peacefully protesting federal policies escalating Mexico's war on drugs. On December 1st, 2012, as former President Felipe Calderón stepped down and former President Enrique Peña Nieto took office, I witnessed some of these groups come together for the very first time in Mexico City. In my next slide, we see one section of a citizen memorial put together by these collectives tying several hundred handkerchiefs together hanging from light posts along the Avenida Juarez, a few blocks away from the Zocalo, which is Mexico City's main public square. It was a powerful event. The memorial was a testament to the incredible violence Calderón was leaving behind, but also to the incredible solidarity that was emerging in response. It was cut short by provocateurs and looters, providing an excuse for the arrest of more than 100 people. And some of these groups stopped meeting, while others continued and continue to this day. But my point is, embroidering the names of the dead and the disappeared in these handkerchiefs, like writing down the names of dead migrants and the toe tags in this exhibit, provided a means not only of raising awareness around this crisis, but also of building new ties of solidarity across cities in Mexico and abroad. Some of the handkerchiefs displayed that day had been embroidered and sent in from Lima, Guatemala, Milan, Nicaragua, Tokyo, El Salvador, Santiago de Chile, Seattle, Chicago, San Diego, Montreal, among others, all listed on the invitation featured on this slide. So I have a question for those of us participating in this exhibit. And that is what's next. The growth of the Bordando por la Paz illustrates that there are many possibilities to build on and expand these practices to bring people together at this very important time. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jeff Ubin in the history department. I teach about the border and about grassroots organizing and politics in Latin America. The Hostile Terrain Project takes us literally to deaths of particular people in particular places near the border. And it represents these deaths in the process in which they are embedded with a graphic, shocking image. As one of the participating historians, I'd like to take us inward, backward, and then outward from this moment to put it in multiple contexts that might inform our thinking about the project and our discussion today. First, inward. This semester, I teach a seminar in the history department called US-Mexican Borders. The course starts by looking at the physical border historically and then traces the experiences in the US of Mexican-American and later Central American migrants. The course shows that the border is nearly everywhere in the US and that there are many different kinds of borders. I've been teaching this class every other year for 20 years, and something has changed about the class. It's become more intense. First, because the texts we read, such as The Beast and The Land of Open Graves, describe great brutality in the present. Second, every person in the class knows that what we are talking about in the course is part of the political air we breathe, that our public politics is fiercely connected to the struggle over immigration and the border. The third reason for intensity has to do with who is in the class. At least half of the students in the class each year grew up in immigrant families or communities and or have parents who crossed the border. In immigration interviews they conducted for the class, students in past years have told of parents who fled domestic violence and were granted asylum or traveled through Mexico locked in a truck and fierced, feared they would die in it or made a perilous journey on foot through the desert, desert and never wanted to talk about it to their children. The border is not something out there. Rather, the border is present in our classrooms and in ourselves. 
Now looking backward, in our current immigration moment and corresponding public debate, the long complex history of Mexican American experience in this country is often left out of the story. It's a truism, though rarely stated, that Mexicans were forcibly made residents of the United States through war. It is even less often mentioned that Mexicans were invited and encouraged to migrate to the Southwest of the US from the end of the 19th century through the early decades of the 20th to work in mines, railroads, and agricultural fields. Since then, they have formed communities in Texas and California and increasingly throughout the entire US and gone to war, joined churches, made music, joined unions, pursued educations, and formed protest movements, such as the student organizing that pressed California universities in the 1960s to hire Chicano professors and bring Chicano history into the curriculum. The same Mexican Americans or their families or communities suffered repeatedly racism, violence, deportation, and redlining, as well as ridicule and exclusion in schools. This history of embeddedness including repeating cycles of invitation and deportation is not new. The history of Central Americans' experiences at home and in the US is similarly intertwined with a century long history of transnational violence, corporate malfeasance, mobility, and community building. Now, looking outward, there's an assumption often repeated that migrants come to the US to achieve some sort of American dream. What is not explored is the profound, are the profound ties people have to places of origin, the frequent and deep lack of desire to leave those homes and the knowledge that the US is a place of hardship. Before the post 9-11 round of militarization of the border, moving back and forth across it was easier and common. And what was most apparent was the way money, people, and cultural practices moved back and forth, with migrants evaluating where and how to spend different periods of individual and family life. The relative ease of movement of the, across the border until relatively recently, and the possibilities of an alternative future this opened up, has also been omitted from public narratives. A notable feature of this back and forth was the phenomenon of hometown associations. I encourage everyone to see a film called The Sixth Section by Alex Rivera that shows how Mexican residents of Newburgh, New York became active members of their community of origin, Boqueron, a small rural town in Mexico while continuing to live in Newburgh. Members of the Grupo Union not only collected money door to door to build a baseball stadium and a water system in their hometown, but they and their children became participants in political and social life in the town thereby changing people's lives, both in Newburgh and in Boqueron. In the film, Rivera draws a map of North America, and he draws circles linking towns of origin throughout Mexico and towns of residence throughout the US. In that, and so this is a map filled with circles that cross the border and go to all different places in Mexico and the US. Imagine, Rivera suggests, that we see the map of North America this way, a map of circles, movement, and exchanges. And I'd add, imagine if we added in movements of investment and remittances, of labor and unpaid care, drugs and crime, flooding and drought, imagination and art, living bodies and corpses. This map, like the hostile terrain exhibit, would represent a North America different from the one we're accustomed to seeing. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this really rich discussion and also to hear about some of the wonderful work that my colleagues across the university are engaged in. Uh, the hostile terrain exhibit resonates very directly with the work that my students and I in the International Human Rights Clinic at the uh, BU Law School have been doing for the last five years. Um, we have been mapping um, through both field work and desk research and ongoing interviews uh, the laws and policies that have been affecting disappearances of migrants across Central America and in the United States. Uh, we are in the throes right now of finishing up a um, massive report that covers El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico and examines in fine-grained detail root causes 
of migration and abuses on the migrant route uh, that uh, has a fine-grained review of the laws and policies in each state and across the region that both cause and could be solutions for the massive and ongoing disappearances of migrants uh, uh, across the region. Uh, we have met with families of the disappeared all across the region and some of our most heartbreaking uh, interactions have been with grandmothers who are raising grandchildren uh, all across the Northern Triangle because their child, the main breadwinner of the family has disappeared. Most of them have uh, been seeking answers for an average of four years. Uh, and in particular areas like in Guatemala, Quetzaltenango, a region uh, called Chichicastenango, where every single family has someone who has disappeared. Uh, and across that small area, it is grandmothers raising grandchildren, making tamales and selling them on the roadside to send the grandchildren to school. Um, one of the main solutions that we are crafting with the uh, close collaboration of our NGO partners and the family collectives of the disappeared uh, is something we are calling a transnational mechanism uh, that's built on a very recent law, uh, the law of victims in Mexico, uh, through which Mexico has established something it's calling the Mexican external support mechanism, which is now connecting uh, the Northern Triangle countries with Mexico and allowing families to file complaints and begin investigations and searches for their lost loved ones through uh, Mexico. One of the big problems is that across the region, there isn't a uniform definition of who's a disappeared person. We have inconsistent de definitions in terms of uh, people being missing, uh, people no localizado, people who haven't been located, people who are disappeared. And then the most important definition in terms of state responsibility is enforced disappearances. That is disappearances where in some way the state has been involved or is complicit. And we know from the mass graves that have been found, particularly in Mexico, but also in the United States, that mass graves indicate state culpability. Um, and you've heard about some of the mass graves. I just want to mention that this year is the 10th year anniversary of the discovery of the mass grave of 72 migrants in Tamaulipas in August 2010 and none of those families has received answers or reparations or any kind of truth in terms of what happened to their loved ones. And that's just one mass grave. We can talk about these, this trail of mass graves across Mexico. Um, so our work is really looking at what laws and policies exist that cross the region and what laws and policies can be built on to find state accountability and to bring state responsibility closer together. The big outlier, not surprisingly, is the United States, which although it is a, a state member of the Organization of American States, the OAS, and hence should be part of the regional human rights system that is connected to the OAS, the Inter-American Commission, and the Inter-American Court, which are extremely important bodies in terms of human rights abuses across the region, the United States uh, refuses to acknowledge uh, any um, jurisdiction over the US uh, of the Inter-American system. So that is a big weakness in terms of the, um, the call for, for a transnational mechanism and transnational responsibility. Um, Although there is a lot of uh, negative and distressing news that we have mapped as part of this, this work, 
We've also found incredible courage uh, from families and individuals and organizations across the region. And one I just want to particularly mention uh, is a, an organiz organizations in each country, the Caravanas de Búsqueda, the caravans of search, because so few answers have been provided by states, the family collectives have gotten together themselves and again led by grandmothers they have been conducting search caravans from um, all through the Northern Triangle all the way up to the U.S. border, uh, going to shelters, to hospitals, to government um, uh, offices, looking for answers and looking for evidence of their uh, lost loved ones. So I think I'll stop there and, uh, and I'm sure people have questions for all of us. So thank you again. Great. Thank you so much to all the panelists. It's wonderful to have you as colleagues and, and to um, participate in this collectively. Um, I, just as a first question it, uh, to, to, to prompt some, some conversation, uh, some of you already touched on the issue of, of um, what the exhibit means to you, but I wonder if we could just explore a little more, what are the, the, the connections, what does this exhibit make you think of? What, when you, you know, if you're, you've seen it at least physically or digitally, um, and uh, you've seen the tags, the sorts of information that, that goes there, the fact that it is you know, a, a, a laborious process to assemble and then engage with, um, what does it make you think of in terms of your own work and, uh, uh, and, and, and possibly future directions you'd, you'd maybe like to go in? So if maybe we could just go around quickly in the same order that, uh, you all just introduced your projects. Um, so if Rachel, if you could kick us off with that. Sure, I'm happy to. Thank you so much. And I, I'm, I'm so happy to have you all as colleagues, all of you who are doing this work. Um, so the immediate thing that the exhibit most reminds me of because of the Guatemalan context are the forensic anthropologists who have been working in Guatemala since the end of the Civil War, digging up the bones of people who were killed and giving the lie to the official story in Guatemala that most of those deaths were the responsibility of guerrilla fighters. Some were, but now we know because of the work of these forensic anthropologists doing the careful work that in fact the vast majority of the killings of civilians were done by the state during the Guatemalan Civil War. And so I really liked um, Susan's emphasis on not just the suffering, but also the dignity and the activism of Central Americans and Mexicans. And Ana was talking about this, as, we were all talking about this in different ways. Um, because there has been a, a lot of support for the forensic anthropologists in Guatemala as they do this work. There has been a lot of support for an anti um, corruption body backed by the UN called CSIG that unfortunately was kicked out of the country by oligarchs in Guatemala. But you also see that now some of the organizing that has helped bring together women, mothers, grandmothers, searching for their children who were lost during the Guatemalan Civil War, very painfully can draw on some of those traditions of um, activism and resilience in order to fight this new struggle as, as Susan was describing. I think like that was the topic of what I try to say. Um, I um, one one of the one of the worries I always have when when talking about the pain of others. You know, I, I don't know if you remember the text of Susan Sontag about the pain of others. Um, is it when you see um, suffering and photographs of people who have been massacred, etc.? Um, is 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 your your is it pity the feeling that we should have, or is it convenient for us uh, to to just feel sorry, right? And how can we actually do a political act, um, not being there or or not being 
part of that. So I, what I really like about the exhibit is the idea of tagging, of writing uh, the, 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 the histories. Uh, and, it's, and it's in the double sense, it is in, in, in tracking, in giving kind of like a scientific basis of, of, of like, like, you know, like forensic, but it's also about, about connecting your, your mind with, with something that is bigger and that maybe is going to drive you to think politically different. And I think that that change of mindset will actually lead you to do something more effective, like what Susan Akram and, and her students are doing, right? Like, you know, get, get into something that is, or, or Jason De Leon, right? Um, so for me, this is the main or the key aspect that, um, that, that we should not see culture as just spectacle as an entry to um, to be able to understand the problems that are actually affecting us all because we are a big community that is the world. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I thought it wasn't. I want to lose you. Yes, uh, I agree with uh, what Adela just said. For me, the HC94 exhibit means hope. It means that people care about those who have been killed by poverty and the need to find sustenance for themselves and their families. And in the context of COVID, it also makes me think about the stories of more than 210,000 humans in the U.S. alone and counting who have died due to COVID, but also due to racism and again, poverty. So humanizing these numbers is vital as has been, I think already raised by a couple of uh, my colleagues here. And what I've seen studying violence in Mexico at least is that there comes a point in which people begin to adjust to a new threat. There comes a point in which people want to get on with their lives, move on. We, see it, for example, now in the non-compliance of very clear CDC protocols. But of course, the threat doesn't disappear and it doesn't stop disproportionately killing the most vulnerable. So innovating ways to disrupt the normalization of death of migrants along the US border, but also the death of those who fall victims to criminal and state violence in Mexico and Central America and the United States seems really important to me, especially now. So that's why the exhibit brings me hope. Thank you. What the exhibit uh, brings to mind to me is the question of how do we see? What, what do we see and take in when we look at locations of crisis and harm? What's sensible to us? What, what can we sense and what do we make sense of? And if we take that, the problem or the, the task of seeing in multiple ways, we can then say, how does it contribute to what we understand and explain and how does it enable us to act politically? So what I find the uh, exhibit doing is it's saying, look, and look in a way that you don't usually look. I feel like that's the, the, the cultural project and the political intent. So that see these tags on the map and uh, begin to think about what it means that they are amassed in that way in these places. Where are these locations? Uh, what was it like to find the body? Who are these people? Where do they come from? What are their families like? I think that's also what Jason De Leon is trying to do when he collects backpacks and shoes and clothing. He's trying to give us, I think, to, to make public and to press publicly for a different way in and a different way of seeing that hopefully will lead us to think differently, connect things differently, make more connections, and perhaps imagine new political futures because we don't accept conventional understandings of what's happening, but begin to put them together differently. So that's what's so uh, profoundly important about the project to me. So I had three uh, reactions when I was filling out the tags. And the first was as I was writing the, the undetermined ones, thinking about whether any of these were the loved ones of the families that we had met across the region. And that was really hard. It was really, really hard because you see how these wounds are, are, cannot be closed. There's no closure. And maybe the answer is here, but it's not going to be provided to the family members to allow them closure. The second response I had is one I've had through this entire project that we've been working on, which is the sense of gratuitous cruelty, absolutely gratuitous cruelty, that is at the heart of migration policies. 
and how it is the direct consequence of pushing the U.S. border farther and farther and farther south and making the rest of the continent pay for the United States' decision to be Fortress North America. And the third reaction I had was, what if the tables were turned and these were white North Americans in Central America, in Mexico? Would anyone tolerate even a hundred unanswered deaths if the tables were turned? And I guess that comes back to my anger about gratuitous cruelty. Thanks all for those, pos uh, for those very powerful um, reflections. I'm gonna go to one question that we have in the Q&A and um, yeah, please submit questions if you have any and we can answer them in real time. Um, but so I, the question uh, I'm gonna broaden but it, because I think that some of the, the, the issues have been touched on a little. Um, so the question is what economic factors drive Guatemalans to flee to the US and take on the language and immigration challenges? And that came up uh, Rachel, while you were speaking, uh, but so maybe Rachel and Susan can both engage that or other people, but just to, to, to broaden it a little, um, I, I was looking at a, an article by Wayne Cornelius, he's a political scientist who was in uh, UC San Diego for a long time, and he, you know, in a number of articles with colleagues, you know, basically showed that the prevention through deterrence doesn't actually deter people. It's not, it didn't result in a decrease in migration, um, and he notes, for instance, that as of the time of writing one article that was uh, 2007, so it must have been a few years before, the wage gap in unskilled labor between the U.S. and Mexico um, was four to six times higher in Mexico. And so they would, you know, they interviewed some 600 subjects, and everyone knew that it's harder to cross and more dangerous to cross, but there still were those economic incentives. So that's sort of the view as of. 15 years ago or so, but now we know that the demographics have changed. There are a lot of more uh, Central Americans than Mexicans, and there, there's um, many more families and children involved in this process. So I wonder if uh, Rachel and Susan, if you'd uh, care to comment on that and if anyone else wants to add to that. Sure, I'll, I'll start if that's all right with you, Susan. Um, that's a great question. And I think the first important point is to say many of the people leaving Guatemala belong to the group that might be identified as migrants, right? So they're leaving for economic reasons. But there's also a large group who are leaving as people who we should, if our asylum system were not broken, legally recognize as asylum seekers. So they may be leaving for reasons that have little to do with their own personal economic situation. The classic one is fleeing gang violence, right? MS-13 and Barrio 18, the two largest street gangs in Central America, have a very deadly presence in Guatemala and prey on poor and vulnerable communities, including indigenous communities. So setting aside the sort of division between economic migrants and asylum seekers to focus on the group that are leaving for economic reasons, I would say there are um, three main reasons that I would highlight that they're doing so. Thing number one is inequality. Guatemala is one of the most socially unequal countries in the planet. Um, there was a brief attempt at land reform in the 1950s in Guatemala, which was quickly overthrown by a CIA-backed coup when the United States became nervous that Guatemala was perhaps veering in a potentially communist direction, which was nonsense because the president was a, a democratic, um, he, was a, he was a Democrat and he had one socialist advisor nothing communist about that. But so since that time, um, we've seen extreme inequality in Guatemala. It's very difficult to eke out a living in the way that Susan was describing. Most people work in the informal economy, are selling tamales, are selling um, tortillas. There is, if you want anything slightly better for your family, it's very difficult economically. So thing number one is inequality. Thing number two, which is increasingly in the news, and this is something that I've heard from many Guatemalan farmers, is drought, right? So it's climate change. This is not the terms in which Guatemalan farmers themselves will put it, but they'll say, la tierra ya no da. The, the land is not giving us anymore. We put, we put the seed and the plants aren't growing because the climate is changing. There's less rain. The rain is unpredictable. The dry season and the uh, rainy season are no longer what they used to be. So climate change is actually an economic disaster for a lot of um, people who rely on subsistence farming. And the third and last thing that I'll mention is debt. 
Um, one thing uh, that many people in the U.S. don't know is how expensive it is to pay a coyote, a human smuggler, to migrate. So leaving aside the ethics of human smuggling and that whole situation, people will go into significant debt in, in their country of origin in Guatemala in order for a family member to migrate to the United States. If that person suffers violence on the way or worst case scenario is caught and returned before they even reach the U.S. border or is deported, that is economic ruin for the entire family. So it actually creates an incentive for more members of that family to try to get to a place, usually the United States, where their wages might be just big enough to climb out of that debt. So it's a kind of debt cycle that I think a lot of people here are not aware of. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, I might broaden the question a little bit to include the rest of the Northern Triangle. What are the factors? Because it is a complex matrix of factors. And one of the reasons that we have been doing so much research into root causes is that the factors don't just relate to current conditions. Um, so I am old enough to have cut my teeth as a, an immigration and asylum lawyer on the civil wars in Central America. When, and I started a project in uh, Los Angeles during the height of the, the civil wars, when there were 600,000 Central American asylum seekers in the United States. And the grant rate at that time for, uh, El for Salvadoran asylum seekers was around 2%, even though we knew as asylum lawyers that the vast majority of the, the folks we were representing faced death if they returned home. Um, so I say that because that is a root cause that very much resonates in what's happening today. We have to look at both push factors and pull factors. And the folks who were able to come and stay during the early years of the civil wars are the pull factors for the family members who are now struggling to survive back home. And they're struggling to survive in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Uh, El Salvador and uh, Guatemala are the two countries with the highest homicide rate in the world. And that includes femicide. Women are subject to killing at a higher rate in El Salvador and Guatemala than any place else on this planet. Uh, and that is also related to a number of root causes going back to the Civil War. In addition, um, after the Civil War and uh, young people were uh, joining gangs in uh, Los Angeles and other parts of California, the US deported hundreds of thousands of Central Americans. Um, and these folks brought that gang culture back with them. And that's particularly true, again, in Guatemala and El Salvador, but also in Honduras. Uh, and that gang culture has fed the ongoing violence. And there is complicity by state actors with the gangs. Um, anyway, that's, that's another piece of the story. But in addition, something that is far, has, far, uh, has received far less attention is the corporatization of resources, natural resources. And this is particularly evident in Honduras, where indigenous communities that are residing in areas where there is uh, their wonderful fresh water and forests have been moved off their lands in order to privatize water and other natural resources. For example, one particular community in Honduras called the Garifuna have been pushed off their beautiful, pristine lands, and they are amongst the populations that are heavily represented in the recent caravans that have co been coming to the United States. Uh, and finally, one last major factor. Uh, we've talked a bit about the migration policies of the US, which also have a spillover factor and cause out migration, uh, but also the Central American free trade agreements. And I'll just use CAFTA as an example. 
Uh, in Honduras, the Honduran government agreed to CAFTA, which has set up these, this macula economy that has undermined Honduras's own labor and employment laws. So the governments of Central America are cooperating in agreements that are undermining the basic rights of their own people. And so folks who are working in the macula economies are unable to make a living wage because that's a condition of the agreements. So again, another push factor uh, forcing people out. There's also little incentive from the Northern Triangle countries to stop out migration. Honduras, for example, one eighth of the, uh, one out of eight people in Honduras has out migrated and the remittances are a major portion of the Honduran economy. So why should governments stop people from going out? That's all I'll say. Um, if I could just expand on that and maybe throw it to Jeff or Adele or Anna, um, you know, I think both Rachel and Susan are talking about historical entanglements between the US uh, and Mexico and Central America. Um, and I'm curious to, you know, bring in history. We've talked about, um, uh, you know, for instance, um, the Civil War in Guatemala, also MS-13, you know, largely forming in Southern California and then going back to Central America. Um, it, it, there's the issue of arms, like, you know, how do cartels get arms? Where is the demand for drugs coming from? Um, so I don't know if if, uh, if if Jeff or others want to just talk about the, those entanglements and what, what Susan said, the complicitness of the U.S. in all of this process. I, I, appreci I appreciated the points that Susan made, and I'd like to build on them just to emphasize a couple. One is that uh, the U.S. was directly complicit in opposing grassroots efforts to create economic alternatives in Central America, be it in the 1950s in Guatemala, the way uh, that Rachel was talking about, efforts at land reform, efforts at different kinds of relationships between government uh, responsibility for social welfare and ordinary people's daily lives. And this happened, uh, the U.S. responded by creating a military government or fostering the creation of a military government in Guatemala. And this was replayed again and again in the period of the Central American, American Civil Wars uh, and preceding them that Susan was talking about where in El Salvador, in Guatemala, in local communities, in labor unions, in peasant cooperatives, uh, people were trying to create alternative economies that could sustain people and create an economy that people could live and stay in. Saying that, I just want to jump to the present and look at how border policy is preventing any kind of local autonomy or cross-border initiatives that could, in a new moment, in a more difficult moment, but in a moment with kinds of potential, create alternative economic activities to oppose or uh, challenge the corporatization that Susan is talking about. So just to get to it on a very basic level, you know, interviews with Mexican migrants a decade ago, a decade and a half ago, uh, showed people who very much wanted to participate in the U.S. economy, go back to Mexico, start a business, bring people back, go back to where parents were. That's what the hometown associations were all about. People thinking about how can we get a water system and an electricity system going in our hometown in Mexico so that we could then go back there and start a business. And how could that business move across the border? So I'm not talking about what NAFTA was supposed to be opening up, which was, you know, high level corporate entrepreneurial movement of uh, money and investment across the border, but what would it mean to create economies that cross the border and that allowed money to move back and forth? Now that's, of course, a hugely complicated proposition uh, in this moment where there is so much violence and where there is so much sort of organized crime. But if we began to think in that fashion, I think we could look forward, which is something else that Hostile Terrain asks us to do and say, what might a more open border or an open border look like? What might cross-border communities in their social life and in their economic activities look like? So that, that's where I would take the, the, the closed down possibilities of the past and try to turn them into what would it mean to envision and perhaps politically and economically support uh, uh, more open-ended people benefiting economic policies in the future. 
I just wanted to add, like, the case of Honduras recently, you know, like, well, I mean, not so recently, but Manuel Zelaya, the, the coup um, that deposed Manuel Zelaya, who had a, kind of like a more um, positive uh, policy towards um, the Lenca people or the, you know, and then the, the assassination of Berta Cáceres um, as, as a consequence of precisely a, a war um, over resources and of like modes of, of, of production. And I think um, one, one thing, one aspect that I think is very important is to, to look at the structural uh, level in order to actually, um, in, in order to actually really try to, to, to change this system, um, it's, it's important to, to have a, a, a view of, of the structural, um, you know, consequences of, of migration. And, and, and I think like uh, Jason De Leon as exhibit invites us to do that. You know, we, we start thinking about these things because, because of, of, of all what it, what it means. So I think information, counter history, as I, as I said, is very important, you know, because um, I, I, I think the idea, the United States has, has been a, a fabulous uh, system in, 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 in democracy, you know, the, the, the institutions of, of the United States are, are, are the basis of, 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 of democracy, but like the way or, or its history with Latin America has not been very nice. And it's very, it's like sometimes students know very little about this history. And I think it's very important um, just to take a critical angle about, about things, no? in my opinion. Great, so I'm gonna group a few questions that we have from the audience, because I think they go together. And so, um, you know, feel free to, to respond to whatever components uh, uh, you think are, are most appropriate. But so, um, one is in what case, and, and you know, I think this is framed by something Anna exclaimed, which is what's next? So how do we build on this? Um, what are our um, uh, paths forward? Uh, what, in what ways can students like me or professionals in this panel move past the exhibit to create positive change in migration policies in the U.S., especially given an administration like our own? Um, do you think this exhibit is engaging in activism? Is there something you'd like to see done in tandem that would enhance the interaction of the exhibit with the broader BU community? And then finally, in what ways can we reach a broader audience, especially, especially an apathetic one? Um, I don't want to take a stab at, at one part of those first. Well, given that I asked the question of what's next, um, you know, there's no quick fix, right? We can agree there's, it's, it's, um, but there's so many fronts that uh, you can get involved in, right? Um, and I, I, I love these questions, like what can we do next? And I don't know if there's a specific student group that is collaborating with this exhibit, but if there is, um, we can continue these conversations. We can do some outreach. There are many organizations working with migrants locally, transnationally. Um, my colleagues here are, I'm sure, much better informed than I am. But let's do that outreach. Like, let's reach out to them. Uh, and the topic of the bordados, which is very close to my heart, I've been wanting to start a group of bordadores in Boston. If you're in, you know, send me an email, anav at budu, and we'll start one. And there's so many fronts. That's what I would say. Uh, choose what you're passionate about, get involved, and vote. <laughs> yeah. I, I would, would say that we can take this forward in two ways. One is to think about how do we change the story? How do we change what people understand is what's happening? Uh, teaching my U.S.-Mexican borders class, it is apparent to me over and over that so many aspects of the history of the last 150 years are simply not known, are not part of the public narrative uh, in terms of people being invited, in terms of the harshness of treatment, in terms of the creativity and excitement of uh, migrant communities in the United States. And I think that we could not, I don't know how, so this is a question, I think this exhibit is part of it. How do we take the, the, such, the oversimplified truisms that are thrown around in public debate and say, see this, see this, this is part of the story. And then whoever you are and wherever you stand, you can't, you, you, if you really saw those things, 
you could stick with your position, but you'd have to make it differently. You'd have to venture out of it. You'd have to, you couldn't say the things you were saying because they simply wouldn't hold up. So that that's one piece. And I think this kind of cultural activism, cultural production like the Hostile Terrain Project is one pathway to do that. And I would extend it to say, we live in a world of cultural production. The, the, the series we see on TV, the images we see on billboards, the, 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 the uh, books we read, the, the, the uh, graphic novels, the TV commercials, the social media apps, so much of the imagery is shaping who we are and what we know. And so we need to think about where are their images, stories, accounts, juxtapositions like hostile terrain, but also much more in the medium that many Americans uh, come in contact with. Where are those happening in ways that push knowledge in a different path and push, therefore, what we can say politically and what we do politically in a different way. I just want to add one very small piece, which is that all of my students write blogs and uh, attach their blogs to our Twitter account. And they are all assigned social media duty during the course of the year that they're in the clinic. And they have to advance the narrative of the project that they're working on, the very legal project, they have to translate it to lay language and convert this complicated legalese into persuasive writing that is going to reach an audience that knows absolutely nothing about what they're working on. And we've been really, I've been really interested at the, in the engagement that this, this our narrative is creating out there in the world and the responses that we get from our tweets and the blogs about the students' work. So it's a way to engage people who otherwise would not be listening to our academic dialogue, who would not go to a hostile terrain exhibit, uh, but it is a way to perhaps convert the knowledge that is generated uh, through universities and institutions and reach out to people to really change that narrative. If I can just add something to everything that's already been said, I would really encourage students and any member of the community to get involved locally, right? This is not a far away issue. We have all kinds of people from Mexico, every Central American country, many African countries who are asylum seekers. I don't want to, you know, this is, this is a, um, this is focused on a particular geographic area, but Southeast Asia, we have many migrants and asylum seekers in the Boston area. COVID has hit, as you may well know, COVID has hit um, Guatemalan communities in Massachusetts particularly hard, especially in Chelsea, but also in New Bedford, right? Those are, um, it, to a great degree, Quiche speaking communities, mom communities, these are Mayan communities, right? So one organization that I've been in touch with that I know about is called Mayans Without Borders that's led by a mom woman, um, Erica Perez. There's another kind of larger mass undocu fund that's raising money for um, undocumented people in Massachusetts who were not recipients of um, the $1,200 checks from the government because of course they don't have social security numbers despite the fact that they pay taxes. But what I would really wanna encourage for students in particular is not just to donate money and then avoid contact. I think there's, there's a kind of strange phenomenon in US life where people live in kind of economic, racial and all kinds of other bubbles. So without imposing on anyone from any particular community, if there is a way that you can live in greater proximity to the people who already live locally close to you, have contact, I strongly encourage students to do that. There's a program through BU, um, many former students of mine have been involved in where they teach ESL on a volunteer basis in Chelsea or in other communities. And not on purpose, but they get to know families, some of whom are undocumented, some of whom are not, Many, all of whom are migrants, obviously, in a more personal way. So that's something that, of course, impacts the student very greatly. This is not just something you are do going out and giving, but this is a relationship that you are building. So I would strongly encourage students to look locally as well. Could I, I just add something like Jeffrey said, that the US border is every, everywhere, is in the United States, it's everywhere. So the, the way to, to change our mindset is to think that, that um, we have the opportunity to maybe um, uh, 
get a different outlook of the world that is going to benefit us in not in in the sense of like i am I am helping somebody who is poorer or in a bad situation, but that that person is going to give me another sense of life and I'm going to learn about their dignity, about their struggle, about their courages, and that I'm going to admire somebody like that, that I'm going to be able to encounter. And that I would say is a blessing. And I think um, art, uh, the, the, the exhibit is, is, is is now here and hence by, by BU Arts Initiative. I would say that art is not only about beauty, art is about politics, but it's also about empathy. And I would like to recommend a film that is not precisely about um, the Sonoran Desert. Uh, it's about Ana Villarreal's hometown, Monterrey, and it's in Netflix. It's called I'm No Longer Here, Ya No Estoy Aquí. Uh, and it's from an independent filmmaker, and it's about um, a, a gang boy, a 16-year-old, um, and, and this gang um, is safe from drugs and violence because their cult is having adopted Colombian cumbia and they became masterful dancers and singers of Colombian cumbia. And it's also a trip to the United States and it's a very sad one, but it's also about the resilience of, you don't have to have attended BU to be a talented young person from whom you, we can learn. So that would be my advice. I'd like to add something to what Rachel said about getting to know people and what Adela said about art change our way of understanding ourselves and others and where borders are. I want to put a next step in front of us also, which is, it is uh, many of us and hopefully more of us will understand the horror and hardship of the kind of deaths and conditions we're talking about. And that leads to the beginning of a politics which says no one should be treated this way and everyone has dignity and people's asylum claims should be heard. But there's a next question, which is when we begin to imagine a future, what would it look like? And often when I'm teaching my US-Mexican borders class, I start asking people I know, uh, what would you propose for the future? does there need to be a border or could there be an open border? And almost everyone says, however sympathetic, but of course there has to be a border. Many people say at least, not almost everyone. So that raises the question, maybe there does, but why? What do you mean? Which aspect of the border, where? And the next question I try to ask is, what would it look like if there were no border? And I think we need to, through artistic representations and through you know, grappling with the issues that Susan is grappling with and also through the relationships that Rachel is talking about, we need to start thinking, well, what about all those claims? There's too many resources, there'd be too many people, our communities couldn't absorb it. Let's open up all of those. What would different communities look like in the United States? What about the capacities of already existing communities that have many migrants in them to become vibrant communities that create economies that bring more migrants and find places with them? for them. So I, I'm at the beginnings of this kind of thinking and I don't want to propose things because I couldn't, but I want to suggest that we need to see the activities that we're talking about, the kinds of cultural and political alliance building and change. We need to always hold open how can we, we together with we in dialogue with migrants themselves, migrants communities themselves, how can we imagine what a different future, even if it seems unattainable now or un, unrepresentable in the broader public, what might it look like? And then what might some experiments be? Where's an example? What would a, a program or opportunity look like that made something real on the ground so that people could no longer say, well, that's not possible. Great, thanks. I think we have time for one more um, hybrid question that I will put together from another uh, two that are up in the Q and A. And so I, I I can see that the chat the chat is full of links to um, you know actions that people could take or organizations they could uh, become involved in that would further uh, this mission. This other one is a little more about um, you know what many of you spoke of of like just awareness, breeding awareness. And in our current political environment in particular. So um, I, I'm gonna paraphrase what these questions are about here, but um, let's imagine 
that we could celebrate Thanksgiving next month. And we are around the dinner table or maybe a Zoom dinner table all eating. And you know, there is uh, Uncle Ed, who's a Fox News watcher and uh, has those particular views on these processes. And you wanna have delicate conversations that are informative um, and uh, and you know also um, you know how you would treat a family member uh, with with different opinions. So so the exact question here is um, how do you articulate the seriousness of these human rights issues that's become so highly politicized? Why do you think the issue has become politicized to the extent where human rights becomes a secondary concern? And then a corollary to that is another question that's talking about what's the impact on locals, say, in the border towns like Arizona, um, and you know what are what are their rights uh, and to property and 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 other variables like that. So thinking about educating on some of these difficult topics of entanglements, history, um, how, how could you reply to you know people who who are fed media of people come from s whole countries and are are not the best people and um, they you know why don't they just invest in their in their hometowns what could you say to those people i can i can jump i feel like it's my role to, to answer <laughs> to so i can jump into yeah, this very terrible and vexed question um i think a question that i've often got from all sides of the political spectrum in the US is you go to Guatemala, you go to Mexico, are the people who are bringing their children to the US Mexican border bad parents? Why would they do that? Why aren't they endangering their children by bringing them to the US Mexico border? And it is true that as the hostile terrain exhibit suggests, this is an extremely dangerous trip. And so the conversation that I try to have is less to you know, fight back with how dare you accuse these people of being terrible parents. Parents everywhere in the world are, with the very rare exception and har horrifying exception of child abuse, parents everywhere are the same, right? They are trying to do what is best for their children. So I try not to kind of strike back. And instead I think, okay, given that the trip is so dangerous, what do you think the parent, what is at their backs? What are they fleeing in their home countries, right? And that can sometimes not said in this tone, aggressive tone that I just shared with you guys, but in a more open-ended way, right? That can sometimes open a conversation about some of the push factors um, for migration, but also the pull factors in terms of reunifying, fa re reunifying family members um, who are already in the United States. And anyone from any part of the political spectrum can understand that it's very painful when families are divided by these borders and say someone who's been living in the United States for 20 years but does not have papers, cannot return to Mexico even when their mother is dying because they will face this fearful return journey if they try to come back to the United States where they've built a life for 20 years. So there are some kind of human ways that we can build these connections. And as horrifying as the child separation crisis was at the border, the one heartening thing about that political response was that it was massive. Because I was worried that after years of um, prevention through deterrence type policies at the border, um, you know, that we had all become, except for those of us who are engaged with this and, and, and travel to these areas or know people from these communities or are in these communities ourselves. Obviously, we are not desensitized. People in the communities are not desensitized. But everyone else, I thought, are we numb to the horrors? And instead, with the, with the massive political outcry in response to the child separation crisis, perhaps there is some broader ground for political agreement about how we treat families. So I'll leave that there. Um, I, I'd, I'd suggest stories and histories, which is related to what Rachel said, that one way of potentially reaching people is by telling stories, expanding knowledge about people's experiences. I think that has to be tied to the alternative visions of history. Uh, because, okay, I see that this person is suffering or this is a complicated narrative, but what would you have me do? So that's where we need to think about what things might look like. Uh, I also think that uh, I don't know how to bring historical understanding into the public sphere. I do know how to bring it to Thanksgiving. Now, my dad uh, was not like Uncle Ed and he didn't watch Fox News, uh, but I could surprise him about every three years by telling him the story of the Guatemalan coup as a matter of fact, because it was a great example that 
really contradicted his understanding of what the US is about. Aren't we a good country? Aren't we trying to make the world safer? Now he trusted me a little, you know, I had a PhD. I don't know what he thought that was worth, but it, it implied I might know the history of Guatemala in the 1950s. But what I'm trying to say is that by actually narrating a story of what happened, a story that now can be told through US government documents, you don't need radical historians telling the story of Guatemala. So I could say, look dad, this and this and this. And a window was created there. It didn't last, again, three years later, he'd be back uh, to, to you know, square one and I could tell the same story again. Uh, but I want to suggest that maybe kinds of historical narratives could, could help us do that. Then also, how do you get facts into the story? Border towns are safe, by and large. Border towns, despite all the popular imagery, are among the safest border, border cities, major border cities, are among the safest cities in the United States. That's one of those things that simply floats through and out of public debate. So how do we, so, so in a sense, the task is enormous. How do you bring stories and history and facts into our public debate. So I'm not sure, but I think that's the path we need to take. I was gonna say one more thing. Um, um, one, day, one time I was invited to Cancun by a friend who, who was in this like, you know, like close, close uh, touristy areas living there. And um, we, I wanted to go out to the town to, to buy some milk and they say, it's very dangerous, don't go out. They rob you there, they do this and that. So my husband and I decided to go because we just wanted to see. And the, 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 what we found in the town was that all the workers who were cleaning the rooms in, 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 in the complex were the, were the dangerous people in the town. So what I wanna say is that the, there is a lot of myth about, about who the immigrants are. The, the immigrants are people who are struggling and if they're trying to come it's because they want a better life as we do and we want to move and we can, we have a, a visa a passport and we go everywhere we want. So I think um, the question, the structural question of the problem of immigration is larger and I agree there is no single solution and many ideological and political views, but there should be no discussion about the right to live. And I think this is a question that we have forgotten. We are horrified, horrified by the Nazi camps, but we are not horrified that there are thousands and thousands of people dead in the desert. And I think this, is, this goes beyond what we think or what we don't. We should not have to ask that question. Uh, maybe should untie it with the very complex problem of, of, of global immigration, you know, the same with Africa going to Europe, etc., or in the Middle East, etc., right? So it's a, it's a big global problem, but we should never um, think that it's irrelevant that people are dying without a name in the desert. Yeah, just to end on that note, the UMP is actually doing some of African migration across the Mediterranean into Europe as well. So that, that project is, is broadening its horizons. So I'd like to thank all of the participants. Um, it's been wonderful to have your thoughts and learn about the projects that you've been doing here on campus um, and ways that students could get engaged with them. And um, you know, I'd like to say just to you know, student groups out there, uh, you know, we imagined when this was coming to campus that we would have big you know, events with pizza for everybody, that we'd be filling out tags and, and assembling this relatively quickly. That of course can't happen in the pandemic. So um, if you have time and the inclination, please sign in uh, through the um, BU Arts Initiative webpage. I think the link's provided. Um, and uh, you can find a time to uh, fill out tags on your own. Um, in front of the exhibit, there's one table, but perhaps larger groups could move to the Ziskin Lounge or somewhere else in the GSU, and we're happy to facilitate that. Also, the, the students who are involved in the co-curricular are gonna be looking to make connections around campus and get this story out and get the impact of the exhibit out. So um, if you're a faculty member who'd like to have some students come and speak to your class, or if you're a student group that would you know like to have a synergy with um, students in the co-curricular, that would be very welcome and it would help us spread the word uh, along the BU community. So thanks to everyone. I'm gonna throw it back to Ty Furman who will close us out. Just on that note, I wanna acknowledge that we have amazing students here at BU. Um, uh, students from the Empowerment League uh, out of the Community Service Center have reached out to us and we're gonna meet with them and try to set up uh, a panel discussion 
with local youth activists um, who are involved in immigration work here in Massachusetts. So we're really excited about the participation that has happened and we're excited about putting that together. We don't have a date or time yet, so keep an eye on the webpage, um, check back with us, uh, keep an eye on Twitter and Facebook and we'll, we will announce that. So um, again, Thank you to our students here at BU who really are looking for what is the next step and how can we make, make things better. And I want to thank all the panelists as well for this tremendous conversation. Thank you. Thanks so everyone. Be well. <laughs>